So it is my uh, distinct pleasure to uh, be able to wel- welcome Nelson Lichtenstein, uh, who is the MacArthur Foundation Chair in History and Director of the Center for the Study of Work, Labor, and Democracy at the University of California in Santa Barbara to the Soapbox. He was also the 2012 recipient of the Saul Stettin Award in Labor History and is the author of 12 books, including State of the Union. Welcome, Nelson, to the Soapbox. Delighted to be here. So um, there are, I recently finished reading The State of the Union, uh, and it's a fantastic book, and it gave rise to a lot of questions, and I think uh, our listeners might uh, benefit from a broader discussion of uh, the history of the labor movement here in America, unionism, and what relevance unionism has uh, currently in America in terms of shaping our future going forward. And I wanted to ask you... Um, Recently here in the Northeast, we had an issue uh, with labor unrest that occurred at Market Basket. And it was a strike of sorts, and it occurred outside the traditional structures or the organized structures of uh, union unions. Uh, there, there was not a union at Market Basket that was represented uh, or representing the workers in this strike. And... I thought maybe we could just kind of jump in right here, and I'd like to know what you think it says about the state of unionism and the labor movement in America that these workers at Market Basket, fast food workers across the nation, of course, workers at Walmart, all of these people are not represented by unions. Right, absolutely. The the Market Basket situation was, was kind of, was very unusual and uh, was right. Was said some in t- in important things. One was um, the, it, because it, there was no union there at all. Although of course you can have strikes without unions. That happens all the time. Um, uh, you know, demonstrations, walkouts, people just calling in sick. You can do that all the time. And the remark, the thing that was interesting about that strike, are two twofold, two two things. The market basket one. Uh, one because the legal you know structures of the of the labor law, such as they are in the U.S., and they're quite, they've, over the years, they've become quite poor, uh, and, uh, were not, did not apply. It meant that all sorts of people went on strike. And, for example, many of the the managers of the local stores uh, were on, you know, were kind of the leaders of the strike, or were on strike. And, made, and they made it clear uh, to the to workers uh, that they, uh, they, you know, the workers would not be uh, um, Persecuted or retaliated if they went on strike. In fact, now in, under the under the existing labor law, if this had been a union and kind of classic strike, and a union, the, this would have been utterly illegal. Uh, it would have been you know considered um, managerial um, manipulation of the strike. It, 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 on many many levels, it would have been considered illegal. But because there was it was not part of a, the, the labor law structure, there was just irrelevant to them. Um, this could take place, and I think what this says is that our old definition of what a manager is has to be changed. That is, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where the real decisions about the market basket, for example, are going to be made at a very high level as to whether there'll be a buyout and whether, you know, uh, lots of debt would be taken on and, and whether, you know, and then, the, then, of course, that would mean that you'd have to squeeze the, the whole chain and the whole, all the workers, including the managers, that, that in, in that circumstance, the so-called, quote, manager of a grocery store was really little more than a foreman. Was little more. It was not, in fact, you know, a, a manager, and we think of it in the 19th century or early 20th century sense. So that's one thing that many of our categories of work are misanthropic today. That's true at, at fast food, for example, where the so-called owner of the of the restaurant itself, he actually maybe has a financial stake in it he's you know uh he he is under the thumb of the national or international company the you know the mcdonald's headquartered in 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 uh, chicago although technically he is the owner of a restaurant and he is the employer of the workers but actually he's he's actually also being a kind of uh, um, exploited and uh, living at the margin uh, because of the way that McDonald's is a national corporation structures thing. So, so one the one thing that Market Basket told us was that that uh, you know a lot of the categories that we have in the labor law just don't fit anymore. They don't fit. Uh, that's one thing. Second thing I'd be quick. I'm quick here is that that clear 
really uh, because this was about a, a buyout. This is about about uh, uh, you know w- whether the firm should be <clears throat> purchased by one group or another. I think it was the brothers. Uh, this was the subject. Now, if this had been a classic uh, labor management uh, unionized, uh, this this subject of, of whether this firm would be bought or not would have been completely off the table. That would have been uh, illegal, uh, not part of the the um, the realm that, that that these kind of negotiations could take place. But actually, it's the most vital subject because. Um, you know whether the firm was going to be bought out by another, by some hedge fund or some, or going to get a lot of debt was absolutely crucial. And so, because it was not a within the labor law, this became the, this was the central subject of the of the market basket strike. So something um, I th- we'll get to uh, some of your sort of prescriptions for how we can revitalize the labor movement in America. Um, before I want to talk about where we are now, and. I had um, a, a author and economist and professor here at the University of Southern Maine. He's been on the show a couple times, Michael Hillard, and oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, in in the course of our conversation, uh, we were talking a little bit about the strike that's happening here at, uh, or I'm sorry, it's not a strike, but the uh, the labor situation here at USM and the fiscal cuts that are coming and some of the the uh, professors who are going to bear the brunt of that. And we got a caller to the show. Who um, was who wanted to ask? Uh, he didn't have time to get on the air, but he wanted to ask uh, Michael about uh, his his pension in a rather accusatory way, and and uh, his his comfortable salary that he receives working. And and in in your book, State of the Union, you quote Scott Walker as saying, "My brother is a banquet bartender, an occasional bartender at a hotel. He pays nearly eight hundred dollars a month for his family's health insurance and can put away only a little bit towards his four hundred one k." Uh, and his point is, uh, is he says, is we can no longer live in a society where the public employees are the haves and the taxpayers who foot the bills are the have not. So I guess my question is, how did we make this transition in, in our culture where we went from this notion of uh, we deserve those same rights and benefits the union folks get to those union folks are moochers and should be just as miserable and penniless as the rest of us. Right, right. Yeah, you put your finger on it. Well, I mean, yeah, yes, the, 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 that is the, your your question <laughs> in a way uh, answers itself in part. I mean, that uh, this is a kind of reaction, a species of, of sort of reactionary populism. Uh, you know, let's level every every everyone everyone should be as misery, miserable as possible. Misery loves company. Um, everyone should be as insecure and, and as possible. Uh, it's kind of a it has a sort of psychological satisfaction maybe for a moment, but it, it, it's not nothing beyond that. Um, well, I think I think that that uh, well, you know, um, good. Que- I mean, the question though is good. How do we get there? How how? And I think we're talking about the realm here, not of of some collective bargaining or some political election or something. We're talking about something more, much deeper in American culture. Mm. It wasn't always that way. It hasn't always been that way in the past. Um, I think it is today. It, it Partly it's cur- various currents uh, of what is legitimate and what is not legitimate, what is considered marginal, what is considered central. I think here, I, 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 in, in a way, here is where people who write, who make create public opinion, who advocate I mean I think that here they have a responsibility uh, to you know make a, a counter uh, an alternative view of how the world should work you know uh, you know out there and I think it's sort of really a contest of ideas a contest of uh, of worldviews and um, it, it you know it, it in part it's it's uh, at the you're at the level of uh, how do you change how do you change cultural norms I, I think we're at that it's not it's not an economic uh, answer to this of the the, the 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 question that you know public employees pensions are better than others uh, uh, they are actually today because of the of the of the rapid decline of, of the private pension system but but obviously the answer there is to either have a one single national pension for everyone that works or to to improve public private pensions. I think partly it has to do with this is the, there has been, uh, the, the right has been ideologically extraordinarily active in the last 40 years in propagating um, itself. The the fact that, you know, the Republican Party, half of it seems to want to reread Ayn Rand. And um, interestingly, Ayn Rand, you know, Ayn Rand uh, was in, in the, in the, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, she was excommunicated from the conservative movement 
on mm-hmm. the grounds that she was an atheist, which she was. Uh, Whitaker Chambers famously wrote a wrote a, um, a denunciation of her, and, and William F. Buckley endorsed it. And others said she was sort of an you know she was a kind of militant free market, uh, but atheist. Um, so, but that sort of come back, or atheism hasn't, but that's sort of come back, and it's kind of it's sort of a bizarre situation. Uh, I have to say that my answer to that prescriptively is a is one at the at the level of um, of advocacy of ideas that we shouldn't be hesitant to put forward a, you know our vision of a of an egalitarian society that works for I think that's just that has to be done in in the most forceful fashion because uh, this we're not we're beyond the level of economics or the, or uh, or taxation or or even ordinary politics when we get sound sentiments like that it seems like so often uh the the and I'm a member of the union. I'm I'm a, a public high school teacher. Um, but it seems so often that unions today find themselves playing a strictly defensive game, and they they seem to fail on the broader level of making that argument, that broader uh, argument for uh, worker solidarity across the board, across firms and companies. Um, have they failed us? Is is the institutional aspect of of organized labor, have we grown beyond that? Does it have anything to to say for us today? Well, I, I, yeah, I think you're you're right that that often, too often, uh, all labor struggles are, are defensive, including the one in Wisconsin uh, against Scott Walker. Although I must say, for school teachers, because just because of the nature of the threat, the threat to school to public, you know, school the public school system, uh, and not just to the union, but the whole public school system is the, the fragmentation, privatization, uh, uh, you know, of, of, the, of, of what was what was a, a fantastic hallmark of American democracy, going back to Horace Mann and the, and the uh, antebellum uh, era. And I think so, willy-nilly, I, I would say that the, the school, that the school teachers and the AFT and the NEA, simply uh, uh, by virtue of, of, of their Need to uh, even to defend what they have has to make the larger argument that that a public system of, high, of of secondary education and higher education, but secondary education is vital to, to democracy. And I think I think maybe imperfectly that argument is being made certainly in Chicago during the in the recent in the strike there a couple of years ago, and um, in the uh, you know uh, and also in Los Angeles and a few other places. So I I mean I do think that, um, that that that's the kind of argument that has been made, and and unions have to be keep that in the forefront that they have to argue that their success is the success of of the rest of society. Now, one reason that's difficult to do, it's not just pig-headed union leaders, although we, there's plenty of them, it is that the law has been structured in such a way, and not, not that new laws have been passed, they haven't, except at the state level, but 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 the, the federal labor law the, and, and, uh, has been interpreted by the courts in, in a way that makes that constrains unions, makes it makes it illegal for unions to do those things that used to be gain them a lot of popularity. Uh, secondary boycotts are illegal. Uh, unions can negotiate over uh, over certain you know questions. I mean, Scott Walker, interestingly, in in Wisconsin, made made the the law made it such that the only thing unions could negotiate uh, on at the, at the public level was the most um, um, the thing that was most um, uh, objectionable, which was like higher wages. They couldn't they couldn't negotiate on any other things, you know, conditions of work, better public service, anything else. Only the most selfish things could they negotiate on. Well, that's sort of a recipe, of course, for for ghettoization and uh, irrelevance. But uh, so I think that um, uh, I I would say I'm somewhat optimistic. I think the unions today uh, have sort of do understand that their fate is linked to that of a larger. Um, liberal order and uh, and make that argument to some extent. Well, so speaking of Wisconsin and uh, Scott Walker, I wanted to ask you because when this when this happened in 2011 and um, Scott Walker was really eviscerating the collective bargaining rights of public unions there, uh, there were mass protests months long. Um, why, in your opinion, was there not? A sympathy nationwide strike on the part of any of the public unions. Did they abandon those people uh, who were bravely standing up to what, what Scott Walker was threatening to do? Well, uh, well, uh, yeah. I mean, 
that's a good yeah that's again you answer you, you, your question is is good and, and it answers itself yes there should have been greater uh, sense of solidarity i mean there was but rhetorically but here is one case i'm not um a particularly uh, an obama basher i i i, I can say we wanted to get into that we, i can say why i'm i'm kind of um in many ways i i, I um I'm supportive of some some of the stuff, but here I would really fault him. Here I would really fault him because uh, he was uh, he could have flown into Madison. He was in that area. He could have flown into Madison and you know put himself at the head of this thing, and uh, would have been a, a fantastic thing. It would have would have would have would have transformed the meaning of that whole event. Uh, it was it was utterly political anyway. It was wasn't like he he was gonna he was gonna save himself from from criticism mm. if he didn't do that. Obama is, is persona non grata on the right anyway. So I, I here is a case where I really I really blame Obama and his people for just not, you know, jumping in I think I think it's a, maybe that was the recall it might have been the recall election, but it doesn't matter. Um, I think at the very last minute he like tweeted, you know, he tweeted in favor of the Democrat or something. But he could have uh, he could have put himself at the head of that movement and that would have been a great thing. The other thing by the way is I mean this is one of the problems. I'm not the Democratic Party clearly is is two souls. So Rahm Emanuel, you know, Obama's right hand guy in Chicago mm-hmm. is like the, the main opponent of the of the, the labor movement in Chicago right now. So this is a this is an issue that that that. Let me just let me just make. Can I? I hope I, I don't want to just make one more point on this. Please go ahead. Um, the 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 fate of the Democrats. Uh, the, the, there's a kind of a lot of wishful thinking that oh, the demographic changes in society, or the Democrats are going to do just going to do well in the future. So just you know, wait for the Latinos to to, to come here and wait for the. Uh, for young people, etc. Uh, no, no, d- d- demography is not destiny. Uh, it requires, uh, you know, ideas and mobilization. And the one institution, just battered as it is, that can mobilize people at the bottom of society and can and then get out the vote and all that is, is the labor movement. For for all of its problems, it, it is far more sort of, you know, actual troops in the field and 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 there then you know then the then civil rights movement you know uh, which which now i mean the, the sentiment exists but it, as a, as an actual movement or or other or other movements in society it it's there and so the it really the, the democrats if they if they if they want to win they have to they they have to support uh, labor as well as vice versa so i think that here um, uh, obama a kind of representative of, of a certain kind of democratic sentiment missed a tremendous opportunity, and I think that will be a disastrous uh, unless they seize that kind of opportunity in the future. What do you think, in your opinion, was behind his reluctance to come out in full-throated support for? Oh the... yeah, yeah. I mean, it was kind of well, it was kind of a, a calculation. I mean, uh, kind of a. Uh, for example, he thought, um, I, uh, you know, okay, if I go to Wisconsin. Maybe we might. Maybe we'd win in Wisconsin, but then we definitely. Then by identifying myself with the union, uh, we'd lose in South Carolina and North Carolina or Virginia or something like that. I mean, I think part of this is the the way you you um, transform the imagery and the meaning of unionism. It's now you know easily uh, demonized by the right and by the center of the Democratic Party is by having it succeed by 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 uh, endorsing it by. By making it a kind of you know part of a movement, that's the way you you make the idea of unionism popular and attractive once again. Uh, you, you can't do it by ignoring it or just you know putting it off to the side. You, you, it, it, it can't be done. It, the, the right is going to is going to raise the issue if you don't. So so I think that I think that is a task of liberalism of of, liber, of liberalism in general. Liber, I mean, I wrote my book. You know the the. From you know 1910 or 1930 or 19 even or in 1960s when it came to the public employee unions and unions of people of color, uh, liberalism was linked to unionism, and that has to, that re, that link has to be reestablished. And um, be, for the sake of liberalism, as much as the sake of, of unionism. And I think you make a uh, rather compelling argument in your book that it's for the sake of democracy itself in America. Yeah. Well. Well. Right. And I mean, here is a kind of mega historical. I mean, when you look for over the last two centuries, since the the rise of <clears throat> of really of um, wage work, you know, the industrial revolution, the, the kind of the, the creation of a working class, the you know, uh, you know, the the rise of 
dem- democracy in, in various forms and the spread of the franchise and, and the deepening of democratic ethos has been linked always and everywhere with, with the rise of, the, of an organized working class, whether it's, you know, uh, Great Britain and the, the First International or, or uh, Spain in, in the era of Franco or South Korea or today in South China uh, and, and Hong Kong, uh, you know, or, or, or the Arab or the, you know, Egypt during, during the moment, uh, the brief moment of the Arab Spring when the real backbone of that, of that um, movement where there were the textile workers uh, of, the, of these, this very large textile industry. So, yeah, the, the union movement has on South Africa, of course. Uh, America is sort of entering a kind of experiment. Uh, can you have really just parliamentary democracy, kind of ordinary, you know, I think it was democracy or the workings of it without a union movement? And I think that's, a, that's an open question because it hasn't happened in, in the world. You know, when you, mm. when you destroy... Um, the capacity of people to form their own organizations, and and that, that's always going to involve working people. Then you destroy the, one of the key bases of uh, really any kind of realistic, real de- democratic, um, um, you know, form of government. You could have the kind of some of the some of the um, the, 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 bureau- the the names of it, but it's not real. As you point out in your book, um, America is somewhat unique among westernized democracies in the sense that we've never had uh, an official labor party here. Uh, And for a time, the Democratic Party uh, served something of that purpose. But increasingly, um, they're failing to to do that. Um, And I wonder uh, what in your mind is sort of behind the shift from the Democrats being the liberal party to the neoliberal party and even you know, you talk about Republicans and how there were liberal Republicans at one time, and they had and they actually courted the vote of some of the more conservative elements of the labor movement. Uh, what what has shifted our entire electoral politics rightward in your mind, or and how is it connected right. to you? Has, well, I mean, you know, as, as lots of people point out, not just me, but lots of other commentators. Uh, you know, the Republican Party has just moved, you know, dramatically to the right, and that's sort of yanked everything else with it. Um, and part, I mean, you know, this this whole switcheroo where the South, where the Democratic Party used to have this enormous Southern conservative element to it, but also this was, all, and this was also the period when the um, uh, when the, the the Northern labor based social democratic sort of Democratic Party was at its most vibrant with people like LaGuardia, and um, actually he was kind of a fusion candidate, but people, you know, kind of liberal. Liberal Democrats in the North in the in the sort of mid-century decade. So this is also the period of the Southern Democrats. Southern Democrats being quite reactionary. Well, now that the, the South is the it really anchors the Republican Party, it just it's just moved that party uh, with 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 no stops, just way to the right. I think it's pulled everything to the right. Um, yes, there, there there had been a period right when the union movement was strong, when liberalism was strong in the North. Uh, and when Republicans who, you know, the, the, the bastion of the Republican Party had traditionally been, you know, Massachusetts, New York State, upstate New York, Ohio, uh, you know, these industrial, that, that the Republicans had had, had to compete um, for for the working class. And they wanted to compete for the working class vote. In the, in the Before the 30s, they did it by high tariffs. High tariffs, that's going to protect the wages of, of workers. And Republicans were, were, the, were in favor of high tariffs. It was the Democrats who were... The, the you know low tariffs and pro southern and the southerners wanted to have low tariffs so they could buy their goods from England. Um, so um, th- you know th- th- that yeah you know, that liberal wing of the Republican Party has just disappeared. Uh, in, in part, it has no place in the Republican Party, and the and then Democrats have sort of won those seats. Um, but um, I, I would say I would say this. Yeah, I would say this that the <clears throat> I'm both of two minds of this. Yes, it's true the Democratic Party's moved to the right. That's true. But also, internal to the Democratic Party, there are not the obstacles, like the South, for, for example, or even Wall Street, although that's partly in the party, uh, that there used to be to kind of a making that party a, a, more, a more social democratic uh, uh, instrument. And I think um, that is conceivable, that, that is possible. It isn't true now, but I, don't, I think that... I, I use, I, I'm not a fundamentalist on this question. That is, we need a labor party. I, I believe that the structure, uh, the legal structure of American politics is rigged against it. So it's futile at this stage, um, at the New York State. Uh, but I do think that there, there is a possibility of, of transforming the Democratic Party into more of a social democratic entity. 